I think that for a lot of uh, audiophiles, they get their start from hearing something in reproduced sound that they didn't think was possible. And for me, it was being fooled into thinking that the sound coming from a loudspeaker, which was down the street and happened to be a clipshorn, uh, I thought they were really people out there singing. And then um, sometime after that, I was at a friend's house, and uh, he played something for me uh, on uh, a speaker that he had built. And, um, and I was just, I was absolutely captivated by it. I, I can't explain it, and I imagine that that's the way it is, you know, love at first sight where, where you, you hear something and, and you're just intrigued by the sound of it. So I started reading everything I could find. And a very good uh, source that, that I read back then, uh, and this goes back to 1958, 1959, was a book written by a British uh, loudspeaker designer Gilbert A. Briggs of Wharfdale Wireless Works. And he, he was a marvelous communicator. Uh, and his books were filled with anecdotes that were colorful and, and actually a lot of technical information, but he managed to make it so accessible that his books became uh, very popular among audiophiles. And he would have little drawings that he'd make. Uh, Gordon Holt did this too in some of the earlier issues of Stereophile where he'd make these little illustrations to illustrate a, a, a technical concept. And so uh, such uh, uh, things as uh, non-resonant uh, enclosures uh, there was uh, a drawing uh, of a, uh, uh, a speaker that, uh, in, in G.A. Briggs' book, uh, which was uh, cinder blocks built into a corner, and it had a Wharfdale 15-inch woofer. Uh, the commercial Wharfdale loudspeakers that had sand-filled baffles. So they had a couple of layers of plywood, and then between them was maybe three-quarters of an inch of sand. And, uh, and, and that certainly uh, controlled a lot of the panel resonances. So even then, uh, I think I and a lot of audiophiles became intrigued with this idea of reducing uh, panel resonances. It is astounding when you look at the loudspeaker designs that have received patents over the years. It looks like a catalog of Rube Goldberg's museum. <laughs> It, it is just amazing. And some of the things you look at, you say, there's no way that can work. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Um, and yet there are many designs which, are, which work, number one, and which have some intrinsic merit to them and which can even be beautiful. And you look at electrostatics, for example. Here they have this low moving mass and, and this large, you know, force over area that's pretty evenly distributed and so forth. And it has strengths uh, in, in terms, particularly its low level transient response. And uh, certain forms of distortion tend to be quite low in those designs. You've got the planers, which have many of the strengths of the, of the electrostatics. Um, you, you've got, uh, I, I remember I bought one of the first uh, ESS AMT1s, which had the Heil Air Motion Transformer in it. I actually traded in a pair of 57 quad electrostatics for those. And I'm sure that people are throwing tomatoes at their computer screen right now at me for doing that. But I was intrigued by the dynamic contrast of that little air motion transformer. Uh, and then there's the cone loudspeaker. They tend to be very predictable, and they tend to be very durable, and you can get very good dynamic range from them. And um, those are all important qualities. And as far as their imperfections are concerned, I remember Gilbert Briggs, he said, when you have a very good dynamic loudspeaker, you tend to forget the imperfections. It's like you tend to forget the fact that in a uh, internal combustion chamber engine, 
you have these pistons banging up and down with gasoline and air exploding on top of them, and it's banging away at a crankshaft and everything when you're cruising along at 40 miles an hour in a Rolls Royce. And I, I like that, uh, where refinement of a less than perfect but very versatile design will sometimes provide better overall results than another device that might be stellar in one or two areas. And um, I've, ha I've, I've listened to all of these designs and I acknowledge the strengths of all of them. But what is needed, in my opinion, uh, for, for one of my products is to have a balance of strengths. I want our speakers to possess that quality that Martin Collins referred to as even-tempered. I want the speaker to be so versatile that you can listen to Palestrina, or you can listen to Yellow, or you can listen to Annie, or you know any kind of music that, that you desire, and that the speakers, the Wilson audio speakers, will always do a good job uh, you know, for any kind of music.